use headphones for best experience. check uh, music streaming platforms like Apple Music or uh, Spotify. Here you can see the latest album released is uh, Telephone Dialing and Deep Voice Reading ASMR. I think it's a good one. And here are the other albums. So check it out if you haven't. show you this um, beeswax tablet that I have created for for this video and um, I'm so looking forward to for the first time try it try to use it um, I made this because I wanted to write some hieroglyphs on it. I've been super interested in hieroglyphs lately. Um, yeah, it started... Uh, I started by reading a lot of alphabets and the origin of the Latin alphabet, the Greek alphabet, and um, writing systems from ancient um, Semitic languages. And, uh, yeah, you, maybe you have seen my uh, writing Greek alphabet, ancient Greek alphabet, and writing Arabic alphabet already. Um, but then I started to read about the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And I wanted to try to, like, instead of writing on paper, I wanted to try to carve into beeswax, just like they did the scribes, or I think many hieroglyphs were, like, uh, carved into stone inscriptions, um, but it was really not many people who who could read or could write hieroglyphs so it was really um, uh, something you had to learn it took a long time there are many many uh, signs letters um, I think it started with around 800 in the old kingdom middle kingdom but then later in the new kingdom and uh, in the Ptolema Ptolemaic period, I think, there were lots of thousands of symbols, so it evo evolved. And uh, this alphabet, this writing system, was, us was used in a very long period of time, from like 3000-something BC to around 400 CE. It's more than 3000 years. And the language evolved, of course, during this time. So the 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 yeah, I'm not sure I can call it alphabet, but I'll I call it alphabet <laughs> nevertheless because I don't know really what to call it. A collection of letters, you know. Um, so the alphabet um, uh, changed, of course, and the sounds which sound um, 
that was used for what sound w that was used for a certain for a certain um, symbol it changed over time um, but I would like to write a collection of symbols called the uniliterals um, the, the scribes or those who wanted to be scribes and like practiced and uh, was trained to do this uh, art form they probably practiced on these types of tablets of beeswax so they could uh, they could carve and then erase it and use the same tablet over and over again so hopefully I'm gonna be able to do the same uh, I still haven't tried to <laughs> to write one single letter or sign yet um, but yeah well the signs I want to focus on today are the uni letters no sorry uni uniliterals um, so it's uh, a collection of uh, hieroglyphs that are represent uh, one hieroglyph represent one consonant sound. So if you like Google um, um, Egyptian alphabet, you'll probably see this list of letters. I think sometimes it's something about. Uh, around the uh, 24 hieroglyphs but the thing is that the e Egyptians didn't have this type of alphabet for 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 um, for single sounds like this they had a collection of much much um, bigger collection of symbols and some of them were uniliterals representing only one consonant but some of them were biliterals representing two two consonants and some were triliterals representing three consonants and the, these three you can call it um, they can be in the group called uh, the phonograms when the, the symbol represents a sound but then they also had the logograms where a hieroglyph represented a whole world, uh, word or idea uh, sometimes called I ideogram as well I'm not sure exactly the difference between logogram and ideogram but yeah sometimes it's called ideogram sometimes it's called logogram and um, then also they had the determinatives that could be placed at the end of words, a sequence of hieroglyphs um, to give a clue to what word it is because sometimes um, because you might have noticed I'm only talking about consonants here there were no vowels so there were like um, a word when you read a word you, you just uh, got a clue which uh, consonant should be there and you had to know the language and um, insert the vowels between by yourself and uh, sometimes um, a pair or a sequence of consonants could mean um, a lot of different words depending on which, what consonant you would put there sorry what vowel you would put in between so then the last hieroglyph could be like a clue showing okay this is the topic you will you, you will think about now because then if you get it you will you will understand what word this will be and there's a lot of like clues and rebus it's like a system of rebuses so um, you really have to think and um, and figure out what what they should mean because all these uh, systems the logograms the determinatives and the phonograms they are mixed in each word so it's uh, it's it's uh, 
you have to figure out if this is what type of hieroglyph is this and uh, could it what can it mean and and um yeah uh, it's like cryptographic or enigmatic writing and um the egyptians probably the egyptians who who managed this uh, this art form who who knew how to write they probably enjoyed uh, to create uh, difficult clues sometimes and write in a very cryptic enigmatic way but enough of talking now yeah i just want to mention that if you want to know how to create these types of beeswax um, tablets yourself i can i can um, put a link in the description to the video i watched so let's start now and um, I'll start with the consonant um, the Egyptian version of the Semitic Aleph that later became the A uh, letter A in the Greek alphabet um, but in ancient Egypt Egypt it was probably pronounced there is only uh, speculation about how how it was really pronounced during back then but um, it could be been have been uh, pronounced like R or L or or something like that um, but now nowadays it's uh, very common to use to, to use the ah sound to to refer to it long ah sound and in ancient egypt this sound was uh, or this uh, uniliteral was uh, represented by an egyptian vulture So here we have my first try to write the Egyptian glottal stop, the A or R or L sound. Um, as you can see I have zoomed in 
bit, I think. It looks nicer if you can see more details. So I'll, d I'll give this uh, hieroglyph another try now. Let's move on to the second hieroglyph in this uh, collection I want to show you today, and that's um, the symbol representing the uniliteral P, P, or P. And that's a picture of the lower leg. show you is um, the one representing the G sound, the G consonant. here of the same sound. is depicting a jar stand and um, why would you need a jar stand you might wonder but um, the jars uh, in which the Egyptians stored water for example uh, they were not they did not have a flat bottom you could not like place it on a, or they were not designed for be, be placed on for a table on a table for example they were designed for be placed in the sand so they were like a cone shaped like 
um, um, yeah, the bottom was cone shaped and um, you could stick them in the sand to keep the water cool in that way. But if you wanted to bring the the jar into to a house, then I guess you had to use this type of jar stand. And as you can see, it's a triangle here, and it's because they were designed with a triangular shaped um, hold in the ceramic uh, item because then cool air could pass through and uh, or air could uh, pass through here and then it would help the water to to keep uh, cool for a little while at least Next hieroglyph I would like to draw is H, the first of four variation of H sounds here, and this represents the the uh, voiceless glottal fricative, so quite normal H, just. This one is depicting a house or a reed shelter. So I guess it's a. You imagine you look, you watch it from, or look at it from above. So it's like a floor plan in a way. This could also be uh, the original shape for our, or the Latin letter B. But the, the Egyptian pronunciation of this letter didn't have anything to do with B. Um, that was when, when some of these shapes of the Egyptian hieroglyphs brought into or were borrowed by Semitic speaking people who invented the ancestor of our alphabet systems. Um, they like took shapes from hieroglyphs and uh, used them for their language and the sounds from their language and is this acrophonic I think it's called acro acrophony or something like that um, principle that you the the first letter or the first sound of a word will will be used as or I don't know how to explain this in the uh, a sound will be represented by a symbol which name starts with that sound. That's the acrophonic principle, I guess. And the Egyp ancient Egyptian language wasn't related to the Semitic languages at all. It was a completely different branch. Uh, deriving from Afro-Asiatic languages, but uh, so you can't really look for 
for the same pronunciation of words in you can't really compare Semitic languages to the Egyptian languages like that. Next I would like to show you the hieroglyph, the uniliteral, representing the sound F. F. Or to be more precise, it's representing syllables starting with letters with the consonant F. Representing syllables starting with the consonant UV, W, or E, or yeah, it's a semi vowel actually, but mm, the W sound, UV, or something like that. This is a picture of the quail chick, the U sound, and um, there were also an alternative way of doing this uniliteral, and uh, it was a much more simple form. this uh, coil shape also representing W next I would like to show you the uniliteral hieroglyph representing the T
of this one represent a hand. And the word for hand was uh, tret or something like that, or T, R T. And then you can you can uh, fill in some vowels there, so maybe something like tret. Next hieroglyph is representing a e sound, Y or J, E. supposed to be a reed, or a flowering reed, a reed leaf. And I'm not really sure about um, the vowel or consonant conflict here. <laughs> um, I think it's more considered, a, or a, at least in the originally, a consonant sound, like a ch J, J sound probably. Maybe later it was more turned into a vowel E sound, but I'm not sure. There was also a variation of this one. Representing a Y or J sound. And another variation. a replacement for signs perceived to be dangerous to be actually written. So then it could represent almost any other sign, I guess, or I don't know which uh, signs were dangerous to, to be written, but then you could replace it using this one. And you can also use it for Y or J. Representing uh, S or Z consonant, so S or Z.
horizontal way or writing S. There was actually another way you could do it as well. Um, then you could um, use another shape, more vertical oriented. This one is depicting a folded cloth. And uh, yeah, the Egyptian language, the hieroglyphs could be written both in horizontal direction and in vertical direction at the same time. So you really composed pictures of it, and sometimes maybe it would be nice to have the to use um, vertical letter here because maybe you wanted to it would look nice to have like three or two um, symbols uh, on top of each other here or something yeah. so and you can also read from right to left or from left to right and or from uh, top to bottom so it's really a variation, and uh, if you if you stumble upon some hieroglyphs, you can guess in which direction they will be read. If you look for animals and humans, because uh, it has to do with the direction in which they look, so they you will meet them with their face first, so that you will read in the direction where you first meet their face. Um, I thought it would be like for some reason I thought it was the opposite because if they walk or something you you think that they should be walking in the same direction as you are reading but they're not they're, they're, if they're walking they're walking towards you as you read Next, I will show you another consonant, um, another H consonant. This is the hard raspy H made at the back of the throat. So it's a <sighs> sound, um, the pharyngeal fricative, the voiceless pharyngeal fricative. is supposed to depict um, like um, twisted flax so some kind of thread here also this could have been borrowed into the proto sinaitic um, alphabet the ancestor of the of the Phoenician alphabet and later the Greek, Arabic, Hebrew, Cyrillic, a lot of alphabets. Um, but yeah. Then I think it represented also some some kind of or more like a ugh sound probably in those languages. But as I said, it's a lot of speculation and guesses when it comes to these topics. Next.
next I will show you the hieroglyph for the ch sound, the affricate t and sh, t and post alveolar fricative ch. This one is supposed to depict a tethering rope. And I just have to show you one of my favorite hieroglyphs, even though it's not it's not uh, uniliteral, so it's not representing only one consonant, but. Uh, it's a combination of this tethering rope and a pair of human walking legs like this. Very surreal, surreal, surrealistic. Tethering a rope with walking legs, it represents some ch and t sound, something like chet, chet. Um, means to take pos possession of, to seize, carry off, conquer, acquire. to show you the hieroglyph for the J consonant, also an affricate, so it's kind of a combi combination of sounds, but it's considered one consonant still, and that's a J, D plus the voiced post, alveolar fricative, J, so it's This is the cobra. Also, this one, the shape of this one was borrowed into the um, Proto Sinaitic uh, alphabet for the Semitic language. Um, and then it represented the N. You can almost see that. It became N. Latin and derives from this hieroglyph, probably, even though not the sound, but the shape. Next, I would like to show you the hieroglyph representing the uniliteral K. -K. Uh, 
basket with a handle and it's a, representing the velar plosive k. for the uvular plosive uh, pronounced more at the back of the throat k, k. Um, we have another related or yeah, we have another hieroglyph another uniliteral And that is basically a hill slope, and it's not um, perfectly clear which sound those uh, these represented. If this was, uh, if there was a, a difference, or which one was the uvular, which one was the velar. But I guess. Um, I guess you have to guess. So now I'm, I'm. I assume that this one is the velar and this one is the uvular plosive. So K and Q. Probably. Now let's move on to. The hieroglyph representing originally it was a biliteral sound. It was R and W combined, probably. So ro, ru, ro, wa. But this symbol later was uh, used for for the sound L because there were actually no no clear symbol for L and when in the Ptolemaic um, period in the first uh, millennium BC um, the when the Greeks had uh, a lot of influence and power on Egypt then they needed a letter for, for the L or a hieroglyph for the L sound as well so this one they picked this one to use for L, so it's a later innovation. So it's the lying lion for the sound L.
Next I would like to show you the hieroglyph for the consonant or uniliteral M. That's a picture of the owl. Later, there was another representation of, of the M consonant, much more simple one. Just like this. And, uh, Maybe it's an unknown object, but uh, some guesses have been like it's. It represents a side somehow. Or I read both unknown object and side. So this could also be used uh, when you wanted like a horizontal shaped letter M, or hieroglyph for the sound M. This is a bit more vertical. Next, I would like to show you a hieroglyph representing the uniliteral for the sound N. N. This shape actually is an ancestor of um, the Latin letter M. So it's something you can you can imagine quite easily. And as you can see, this is a very horizontal oriented. Hieroglyph, and uh, there was also another version that you could use, probably for more um, in a more um, vertical context. Place it here.
uh, this is also N sound, the N sound. And it's depicting a crown, a very special crown in the ancient Egypt culture. It's a Teshret, the red one, the red crown of Lower Egypt. So before there were the United Egypt. There was a red crown for the ruler of Lower Egypt, that's the northern part, and then another crown, the white crown, I think it was called, for the Upper Egypt, another design crown, and then there was a united crown, when Egypt was united, both the crowns combined. Just like uh, the L, the lion for L here, that was a relatively modern invention from the late, I guess, f uh, first millennium BC. We have a uniliteral representing the O sound, O or W. Uh, I did show you another W uniliteral, but this one you can see sometimes uh, representing uh, or replacing I guess when it this is later history when the ancient Greek alphabet was already in use and there they had the O letter they had both the W I guess or the some kind of V or Y letter um, but anyway, there was also a new letter O that hadn't been used in the Egyptian language originally. And then when there were new Greek words coming into the, the Egyptian culture world, they needed a letter for those words as well, probably new names and such things. So then there, this um, hieroglyph was given uh, or started to represent the, the O letter. Originally I think it was a pi literal uh, for a W sound combined with the glottal stop. So wa something like wa or wa. And it's depicting a lasso. I think I have room for three more hieroglyphs here because they are quite uh, horizontal shaped. Sorry, I think. This one is more pronounced O, 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 not O, like I said. It's a forearm, palm upwards, and this represents the sound uh, originally, hein, um, the um, voiced pharyngeal fricative used, for, for example, in modern Arabic, um, but not 
used in many languages today. But this was uh, Egypt's representation of that sound. Hain, ha, ha, that sound at least originally, and in some dialects, scholars think it could have been representing a T type of sound as well. T. This is a very simple shape, and it's the uniliteral hieroglyph for p, p sound. Um, and since it's so very minimalistic, it's been um, interpreted as a stool, a mat, or a door. I read all those three, three uh, representations. Next, we have the uniliteral for the sound r, r, r. Uh, in ancient Egypt, it would most probably pronounced like um, the alveolar trill. R, r, r. is depicting a mouth seen from from the front yeah uh, the hain representation from egypt this hieroglyph was is also the origin of um, the Proto-Sinaitic alphabet. Uh, then it's the Yod, the J sound connected to this to this shape. And uh, this one probably could have been the origin this picture could have been the origin to the proto sinaitic uh, letter for the sound for P in Semitic languages. I think the word mouth in uh, some Semitic languages is uh, related to, or it starts with the sound P. I'm not sure if it's P or something like that. tablet. Then we have the hieroglyph representing the consonant sound sh. So it's a post-alveolar fricative, voiceless. So sh as in ship. Then we have some kind of pool water filled the pool. Represented, represented 
quite plain like this, but sometimes also with some symbol for water in it. Also, I have an example of a variation here. try and I, I want to do this uh, double country lines sometimes referred to as a deep pool and uh, yeah the hieroglyphs were originally like um, they were sculptured in a way uh, carved or carved into stone and um, they weren't really linears like like I'm doing here um, there's a difference between the linear writing systems and um, other types of writing systems that you can't really translate into just a line and draw all the characters using lines. But these are more sculptural uh, created. For example, the very very first writing known writing system, the CUNY form from Mesopotamia, around 3500 BC. You've they have found evidence of this writing system. That was more like stamps. Um, yeah, you can't really. It's like wedges press into the surface uh, and you can't really represent it by just two dimension two dimensions and a line and the same thing with early hieroglyphs I guess so when when I draw or when it's represented by double lines like this it, um, in the reality when it was carved it was probably one line but sculptural, so it was a thick line, um, gradually um, like gradually down in the surface. I, I'm not sure how to how to describe it right now, but um, they could be really detailed in the faces, for example, in and the animals and the humans and the gods it could be very detailed and like a relief relief um, picture so not th uh, totally three dimensional sculptures but yeah you can think of it as a relief image so um, combination of uh, sculpture and drawing in a way and later they started to use a papyrus to write with reed uh, pencils, I guess. So and then it was more another type of letters, the demotic alphabet. There were also other types of types of alphabets uh, developed from the hieroglyphs that were used more in, in uh, when they were writ were written on papyrus with a uh, pencil 
It was called something else. It was called hieratic or something like that. Script, a letter, the demotic script. So the basic shapes were probably related to the hieroglyphs, but it developed in their own way and became like a rapidly written uh, cursive script. Then we have the uniliteral hieroglyph for the letter T, the sound T. It's a very simple shape, very common hieroglyph as well. You can see it a lot in hier the hieroglyphs. I think also it could be some kind of um, determinative at the end of words for um, um, for um, expressing that it's like a feminine word, so it's a grammatical had a grammatical use as well. Yes, yeah, some of the hieroglyphs were numerical had numerical um, values as well. I think the quail chick and the, the coil also had some numerical values, not just the W consonant. And we have already seen two variations of H, I think. I'm, I think I mentioned we had uh, the four Oh, sorry, I have to, to show you also another variation of T. Uh, I place it here. It's a more vertical, more vertical representation of T. Uh, and it's a pestle depicting a pestle. It was also used, I read, as a um, biliteral, not just a uniliteral, but, but biliteral, then it's for T-I or T-J probably, I'm not sure, T-I, T. -I -T. Um, so, but uh, later these were two Hieroglyphs representing the same sound, the T. Then we have w the third H. It is, um, let's see what we have left. We have the velar fricative. <laughs> that type of H. This could be a sieve, perhaps, but it's quite difficult to see what it could be depicting. Uh, so I read also an unknown object for the <laughs> sound.
supposed to be an uh, animal belly seen from I don't know but this I guess this is a tail and this is a belly um, there were a lot of, of hieroglyphs uh, depicting like parts of animals for example just the head of an animal or everything except the head or um, and also like uh, hearts and lungs and such things and this is uh, the belly and it represent it represents the sh sound so it's um, palatal fricative <laughs> also some type of H sound when you transliterate in Egyptian language you often use a plain H like this for when you tra um, transliterate it into Latin letters um, so this is uh, the sound and then it's the um, sound, the pharyngeal fricative, and it's the. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's see if I can erase. of the sound the velar fricative and last we have the transliteration of sound the palatal palatal fricative so glottal fricative pharyngeal fricative Velar fricative and palatal fricative in Latin letters. So I think I have gone through all the unilaterals now. But the last thing I would like to do is to write something like a proper word in hieroglyphs. I'll use this part of the tablet here. And the word I would like to write is Ra-N-Ku-Mat. Uh, ra mat And that means so the speech of Egypt or the Egyptian the ancient Egyptians word for their their own language
This is a determinative, just one stroke. And um, what it means is that this should be read not as a phonogram actually, but as a logogram. It says that um, this this means uh, what it represents somehow. <laughs> so you should not uh, read it as just an R, any R. Um, it's uh, actually the mouth somehow. It's a word. It's a logogram or ideogram. Um, and um, I guess it has something to do with speech then. Maybe it means speech it's an open mouth. Then we have the uniliteral for N. -n. So I guess the word for speech must have been ra or ra or glottal stop ra something like that. N is the sound. So since there is not um, a determinative here, uh, you should not read it as water. It has nothing to do with water, it's just the sound. a biliteral sign representing KM in one sign. So instead of writing the uniliteral K and the uniliteral M, you can write KM all at once. And the picture is supposed to represent crocodile scales. Maybe the word for that was something including K and M, and then some unknown vowels in between. So, then this word for crocodile scales could be used in other contexts, in other words, other meanings, uh, sentences, when, when we had the same consonants, K and M be represented somehow. Then we have the owl. I'm not super happy <laughs> with the, this version of the owl. It was a bit tricky to draw it this small actually. But it was easier when I when I wrote it a bit bigger. But it's the owl representing the uniliteral m m. And it's not because you will have k m and then m again actually, it's because you show the, the uh, M consonant again, one more time. So you have it both here, in KM, and then we have the M here. I'm not sure if this biliteral could represent another pair of consonants as well, because that's not uncommon. I, I, there are many biliterals that can be representing two to a pair of consonants and also a pair of completely 
different consonants and then you don't know which combination should be read here and then you can show it by adding the second consonant as a uniliteral again <laughs> after it. So, so yeah, it's a bit um, it's a bit complicated sometimes, and uh, you write write more than you probably need when you write writing hieroglyphs. So K M. Now we're sure it's K M because uh, it's M. It's a second sound. And then we have T, the sound T. R, uh, k, m, t. And if you place some vowels in between, we can get R, n, k, m, t. Um, the name for the country. Egypt in Egyptian is actually Kemet or Kemet and some E vowels in between just to make it easier to to pronounce. So Kemet Kemet could be represented by these three. Then we also have a determinative at the end. And uh, this is the determinative for town, village, or inhabited area. I really like this determinative because it it uh, it says that this is a geographical. Uh, this should be read in a geographical context somehow. So it's a, like a cross and a circle town, a village, or I guess in this case a whole country. So it's not pronounced at all, it just shows how to read this. Because KMT, I'm not sure, but probably it can mean a lot of things if you if you put in other, insert other vowels in between, it can mean something completely different. But here you can say, ah, it's, it should be a place name. I guess it's Kemet. I guess, it, I guess it's Egypt. So the speech of... Maybe this is of, somehow, speech of Egypt.
this video interesting and relaxing. Thank you so much for watching and sleep well. Take care. Stay safe. See you soon.